All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless Dave here talking real music in real time for real people, just like you and just like me. And today, actually, it's uh, also just like John Nixon. Mm -hmm. John Nixon is kind of the mastermind behind this new band. I was doing a little surfing, John. You know how you surf okay. the web? Yep. You look for music and then you get a suggestion. This is what you ought to listen to. And I stumbled upon this group called Page 99. Right. Now, Instantly in my brain, because I'm an old geezer, right? I thought, 99, could that be like the Toto 99? Could that exactly. be Page from, and even before I read the bio, I said, okay. Page, I said <laughs> Page 99. This has got to be some kind of a 1980 keyboard-based, um, where I need a, a large boat, right? And I, <laughs> like a cabin cruiser. And I got my little, I got my little Gilligan hat, hat, or the yep. skipper hat, probably, not the Gilligan hat, but. Right. And, and lo and behold, I, I click on it. I'm going, holy crap, Batman, this is great. So wow, thank you. <laughs> tell us about Page 99, how it got started. It seems like a, a musical collaborative. And in other words, you bring people in and you have them sing, have them right. maybe play different instruments. Um, this is right. You're, you're taking like the David Foster, Jay Graydon playbook here. And what I love about this is it's legitimate. It's not cheesy. It's really well done. Well, I thank you for that because uh, from the beginning, it was the desire was to n uh, not sound like modern yacht. Now it's modern, but it's yacht rocky, which is a you know a, a different term that we could get into. But I wanted it to sound not like a modern take on that, such as like a Young Gun Silver Fox or something, bands like that. Yeah. I wanted it to sound like it could have been on the radio in 1978, 79, 80. Uh, so I took a lot of care to approach it that way. You're right about the name of the band, uh, obviously, that uh, Page 99, Richard Page, Pages, became uh, Mr. Mr. later on. Yeah. And then 99 from the Toto song. Originally, the idea was to call it FM 99, which was a, would have been a nod to Steely Dan. Yeah. Uh, but that confused some people thinking it sounded like a radio station. So that's when I came up with this other thing. But the Steely Dan model is really what this is. And you yeah. kind of hearken to that is that it is primarily myself and then Russ Fitzpatrick, who is the vocal arranger, kind of the Michael McDonald of the group. And everything else is done on a session musician basis, bringing in people for, you know, specific things that they do really, really well. Yeah. You know, so it's not a band as much as it's a studio project, much in the model of, you know, the Asia era of uh, Steely Dan. Yeah. OK, that's so. Uh, so this band probably won't be going out on the road anytime soon. Well, the bass player is in L.A. I'm in Detroit. One of the guitar players is in Philly. Uh, one of them's in Pisa, Italy. So getting the getting rehearsals together would be a drag. <laughs> hey, well, it might be fun, know. but it'd be hard. We could say this. It worked yeah. for Steely Dan, right? They did one tour or something like that. And then yes. they just decided, you know, you can't really argue too hard mm -hmm. against, you know, uh, Becker and Fagan and, and the kind of That's results right. they got. And then they were so studio focused. Now, um, so I assume you're not using a lot of Pro Tools to create sounds on this record, correct? That's correct. I'm using, I actually use Cubase, but I use it as, um, as I sort of explained in the bio, I try to approach everything like I have a 24, uh, 24 track tape machine running. Yeah. Um, performances are recorded from the beginning of the song to the end. That's not like I'm going to create a four bar keyboard loop and copy and paste it down or drums and any of that. There is some fix and some tweaks and things that go on the way because of the ability of, um, you know, the digital production and stuff. But I kind of liken that to they would punch in and do takes over and over until they got the right take. So yeah. I'm not averse to doing some fixing along the way, but I'm not doing, I do not want the first chorus and the second chorus to be carbon copies of each other. You know, I yeah. want there to be a reason to listen and listen in depth. Sometimes, you know, headphones, because things do evolve as the song goes on. There's little candy, as I like to call it, ear candy that happens and so you come back to the song five, six, eight times later, and you're still hearing new things. Right. And um, one of the things I love about your music and some things that I hear now and then when people try to do this sort of format is 
the guitar solo like the mm. guitar solo like i grew up with steve lukather i grew yeah. up with all yeah. of these great players who would just they would tag a song it was like you you knew it was a great song because here comes the solo and the solo is melodic it's fluent it's interesting it belongs there and you know i know you, you probably are a big yeah. fan of jay graden who came uh -huh. up with one of the great <laughs> greatest guitar and I, you know what i think solo, jay graden man. too i don't think that jay graden is a super amazing guitarist but i think he's a very he's a technically savvy and sound player and mm -hmm. i hear a lot of that on this record which is so cool well i um my my guitarists are all have different sort of sensibilities but each one of them I've given them almost the same direction each time. I want them to do their take, and I give them three guitars. I give them Steve Lukather, I give <laughs> them Larry Carlton, Ooh. and then I give them Jay, uh, Jay Graydon. And um, there's specific things about them. And one of the things about you mentioned Graydon is that he, um, we talk about this actually in the podcast that I'm a part of, is that Jay Graydon's approach is that of a producer. Because when Jay, if you listen to his solos, each solo has sort of a thematic idea that he's expressing yeah. and he builds this solo with this idea in mind sometimes it's based off the melody sometimes it's based off of an opening lick but it's not just okay roll it and i'm gonna you know blaze all my licks down so he's a very much a thinking man's you know from a producer's standpoint guitarist yeah and i think it's peg right is his epic yep. solo and um I guess the boys and Steely Dan were really getting frustrated and Jay came in yeah. and just nailed it. And they're like, that's, that's the take we're going to use. Um, and I know the, the approach to this kind of music, even though people might think because there's not, it's, it's, it's very airy. All right. Which mm -hmm. I love because you can hear everything. Yeah. Whereas today, everything is real crunchy and compressed and right. there's, there's no love. There's no warmth in it. You know what I mean? I hear, I heard one, I, your, even your take on, you guys did the airplay song. Um, Nothing you and, can do about it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard that. I go, this is, this is like, we're putting our flag right here. That's and we're going to, because that's the original. People always say that album is just so produced. It's too much. But that's like David Foster and Jay Graydon just running loose, doing whatever they could. Um, and I love your take on it because it's just, it's like you don't try to overdo it. You just play it and you mm -hmm. kind of put a little bit of your own spin on it, which I, I really enjoyed. Yeah, when we put, as you say, a flag in the ground, we did that specifically when we decided we were going to do three covers on the record. We, You know, the name of the album or the name of the group sort of, pays homage back to that era but we also wanted to do cover three very specific things that sort of covered everybody that influenced the record and so by doing nothing you can do about it it covered jay graden and david foster we did a toto cover and leah yeah and then we did uh who's right who's wrong which originally was pages but also includes kenny loggins as a co-writer and he did it so we wanted to make the statement that this is what we're about and we didn't reinvent them in some different way we said we want to be here's what we would be like playing these songs back in the day yeah and um the result is really it's really cool it's the album see when when bands do covers of songs typically the cover stands out like a sore thumb mm -hmm. a lot of times but what I noticed on this record is like everything kind of fits, you know, it, it just kind of mm -hmm. rolls together. Like if you guys had come up with those songs, I would say, oh, those are good songs. They fit right on here, which is a real testimony, I think, to maybe your musical background. Now, where did you, I mean, I think I read some of your bio yeah. Are there Berkeley grads here. Or what, what, what's going on as far as your, your background? Yeah, I was in, uh, at Berkeley back in uh, the, uh, I guess I can say late eighties. <laughs> so Berkeley College of Music uh, is where I really laid the groundwork. Before that, I was somebody who loved music, was getting into music. I started to discover what a music producer did, yep. and I became enthralled with that. But then, you know, the, the question is, well, how do you make that leap from kind of living in a small suburb outside of Detroit to that? Um, mm -hmm. So Berkeley became the answer, at least in terms of getting the education. And I, I swear I still use that education, the stuff that I learned there to this day, especially now that I'm doing this stuff again, because there was a big gap where I wanted to make this music back in the 80s, but didn't really have all the pieces in place to do so. 
then you get involved in, uh, you know, having to make a living. And so you find a way to facilitate that. And now I'm at a point where I can really dedicate myself back to this. And fortunately, it coincides with sort of a, a resurgence in popularity, you know, through the Yacht Rock movement and the West Coast AOR stuff. It's just all kind of becoming back into pop culture again. So, yeah. And um, that's awesome. Um, and, and I'm really impressed, too, with the people who are into this because they really know you have to kind of be educated a little bit about the producers, the writers. Um, the guys who arranged the tracks, you know, back in the day. And what people I've noticed are digging up like these things that didn't go anywhere. Um, yeah. Back oh in 1978, gosh. they'll find an album. This guy, Ned, I don't know if you, you I'm Doheny. sure. Doheny. Doheny. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like his stuff is so good. And you sit there and listen to it and go, why wasn't this promoted back in those days? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, the theme running through this because there's a lot of music if you go searching for it. Uh, unfortunately, um, in today's sort of terrestrial radio world, unless you have your own little show on a lower band like FM mm -hmm. station, um, you're not going to hear that. And it's sad because there's a lot of people that still want to go, you know, take a ride in their car and hit the FM button and yeah. hear some great music. And everything, I, I do this thing on my show where I talk a lot about focus testing, like everything gets focused. Like you, even the song, <laughs> yeah. when's the last time you drove down the road and heard 99 by Toto? I know. Well, unless you're listening to uh, something, again, that's total specific. Yeah, probably not on traditional terrestrial yeah. radio. Right? When I when I was a, okay, and I'll age disclosure, I was a teenager when that song was out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, we had like, I lived on Cape Cod and there were like four radio stations that were AC, that were adult contemporary. One was a little more album. That was my favorite one because they went off the, the, the grid a bit and they would play deeper tracks and stuff. I remember you could you could hit the button and hear 99 yeah. and then you'd hear, you know what I mean? You, you would hear like Jackson Brown and the Doobie Brothers and, and it was just like, boom. And that's the kind of stuff, like I always tell people, uh, John, if I get stuck on an island somewhere, that's the music I want to have Absolutely. with me. Because yeah. these are the musicians. As much as I like, I do enjoy some hard rock. I like blues. I like a lot of different formats. But I tell you what, you can just like sense the quality here. And these songs, like what's great about your album is these songs are instantly melodic. They're not difficult. They're very easy on the ears. And as you you pointed out, there's a lot of ear candy. Yeah. Like what else? What else do you do to create that sort of ear candy experience? Wow. Um, that's, that's a really good question. A lot of times I will, uh, a lot of that comes from sort of the instrumentalists, like the soloists that I might bring in. Um, and because we're working sort of remotely, I will ask something very specific for maybe the rhythm parts and the main lead part, and then ask the player, you know what, then you send me that, but then erase all of that from your mind and just play along, you know, top to bottom, um, consider yourself, like you say, Larry Carlton, who was, you know, just a genius at being able to fill and work around a, a vocalist. David Sanborn is another one that just has a way of playing two notes and making an impact. And I would tell them, give me some passes at this song like that. And from then, I'll kind of go through that stuff and kind of pick the elements that I really like and sort of assemble a, a take out of that. And sometimes that stuff is really buried in the mix too. I get, sometimes my guitar players will say, man, I played that great riff there and you kind of buried it in the mix and <laughs> like, but you know what, then somebody will say, you know, they've, I listened to that song a dozen times and I never noticed that. And I noticed it today. I think that is so cool. So those are the things that keep you interested in a song. Modern music, everything, as you said, is pushed to the top and everything is out front. And you've heard the song three times and you've heard everything there is to hear. And that's what makes this stuff so that's interesting for a desert island kind of situation. Yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned the headphones, too. I mean, yeah. the first night I heard your album, I, I'm like, crap, I got to go listen to this on headphones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, got my phone, Bluetoothed it up. And I sat there and I'm going, this just, I mean... I don't know what your budget is, but it's, it just sounds like <laughs> it's a really high budget. Uh, well, fortunately, I'm playing a lot of the stuff, you know, yeah. so um, I take care of the, you know, the drums, all the keyboard stuff, a lot, all the synth stuff, some yeah. of the more basic guitar stuff. And 
Um, and, and most of the other guys that are involved in this are involved in it because they want to be involved in it. You know, it's uh, so nobody's doing it for the paycheck of it. And that and that makes great music. You know, it's right. uh, true. It's just the way it is. And so what's you know. uh, what's the response been to this album? I mean, I can't be the only one that's figured this out. No, I, you know, I did an interview. I've gotten um, requests for interviews. I actually did, like I said, one from France the other day. I've gotten requests from uh, labels in Japan. There's a, a label in Japan that has an exclusive to release it there. Nice. There's a bonus track on that album. Um, they made CDs and, and all that stuff. And they actually, I saw somebody sent me a picture of Tower Records in Shanghai and showed my CD up on the wall with a big banner uh you know, page 99. And then I could see to the left of it was Steve Lukather's album. And to the right of it was Bill Champlin's album. <laughs> so, Hey, you know, they're doing a good job over there. And, um, but Sweden, Sweden's another really, really big one, uh, that yeah. are really in Italy. There's, uh, stations in Italy and France and stuff that are picking it up and blasting it out there. And it's, uh, you know, it's all over the world, which is what's amazing. Cause I haven't promoted it. I don't have a promotion, uh, machine. You know, right. right. Well, yeah. hey, John, that's my job. Okay, that's why I'm. That's here. right. We hope that we get calls like yours because exactly. that's how the machine kind of. That's the that's the web. And people you know? will tell me they're like, you know, that's a little bit off track for what you do. I actually interviewed. Um, I don't know if you know the state cows from yeah. Sweden. We I interviewed them, them as well on our podcast. Yeah, early adopter to their yeah. stuff. I first heard yeah. them and I was like, who is this steely band ripoff? You know, I know. I started listening to it and. Um, they'll even they even told me it's like, hey, of course, this is what we, yeah. you know, they try to even lyrically kind of try to think like that. Do you do. when you write when you're writing lyrics, is there is there a band that you're trying to or is it just like throwing everything into the kitchen sink? I, I recently have started trying to write some more Steely Dan kind of stuff, and I'm not sure if I <laughs> people people will have a hard time believing this. Be, those that know me would be shocked if I say I can't amass the level of sarcasm that Fagan does. <laughs> Even though if they knew me in real life, they'd say, "Come on, you're kidding me. You're you're sarcastic uh, all day long." Uh, but I think I get some. Um, I would say the Toto and like Bill Champlin type of stuff because I. You know, obviously it's an age thing where you get to a certain age and you start thinking about nostalgia and stuff. And I think a lot of my ideas come from nostalgia. And a lot of my ideas just come from understanding that there's more to life than just working like crazy, you know? Yeah, that's and that's good. And I think with what's been going on for the last year and a half or so, yeah, um, there are a lot of people right now that kind of want to just um, unplug a bit. Yeah. And sort of decompress. And There's a lot of pandemic it, writing going on too. Yeah. I tried to avoid that because I felt that there was a lot of that going on. Yeah. I was, I mean, journey just dropped a new song. Yep. And it, it, it was a complete pandemic thing. And I was like, yep. really guys, Yeah, I'm trying to forget this. I'm not trying to like, that, that was my thought that yeah, a couple years down the road, are people going to want to hear songs about the pandemic? I, I don't think so. No. <laughs> and right now, I think, like I said, you talk about nostalgia, escapism, whatever you want to yes. yes. call it. Um, I, that's why I'm loving like 1979. I mean, just bring me right there because there was none of this. And and this is all the rich richness of the music and the texture of it and all these different people who um, roamed the planet and, and made this kind of music, whether it was Toto or Boz Skaggs or oh, just yeah. what yeah. an era, man. It's good. It's good that I have a fellow sort yes. of uh, soldier in this uh, to bring this music back a little bit. So what are your plans? I, I'm assuming you're going to continue to make music. Do you have anything new down the pike? I thought I saw another song pop up yesterday mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube that was by somebody else, but it had page 99 as That's, like the, yep. tell me about that. And actually that is releasing today. Okay. So um, I don't know when this will air, but uh, yeah, today, as of today, it's a new song. Uh, there's another artist out there that is uh, we sort of share a kinship in terms of our love for this style of music, Christian Gratz. Okay. He's done a few albums. His most recent album was sort of a, not, a little longer than an EP, a little shorter than an LP. It's like seven songs, and it was called 1981, and it directly targets like that era of the Yacht Rock thing, like the early, um, the pre-80s Hall and Oates, Robbie Dupree, stuff like that. Oh, I love that. And uh, I, I said, you know what? You you just released an album. I just released an album. We're going into this period where people will have discovered our albums. 
but always ask the question, well, what's next? What if we just did a collaborative single and bust out a really smooth sort of summer banger type of yeah. tune? So he wrote the song and I agreed then I would do the arrangement and the production after the fact. And I brought in the page 99 guys, uh, Andrea DiPuccio, who is the guitarist from Pisa, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, to nail down the solo. And uh, it was just a really fun way to collaborate with someone else's musical, at least canvas that I could produce. Yeah. And it, it drops today and it's, it's, we love it, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And if, um, New fans want to reach you guys. I know you have a website. You got merchandise. Is that correct? You got merch? I do. I have paid. It's page99merch.online. So, and uh, that is t-shirts and sweatshirts and the usual stuff, mugs and things like that. But I've got a couple of different uh, things. One that's built off of the artwork, that uh, sort of FM radio dial that's kind of blasting out of the screen at you. Looks good on a t-shirt. And then the, the logo itself, like black on plain white, looks really good too. So Yeah, I might have to get one of those because yeah. what I, oftentimes I wear certain shirts to kind of you know, drop, drop hints to people when I do yeah. videos, um, what I'm, I was going to wear one, but I thought it would be too, uh, <laughs> too pretentious. That's the word. Thank you. <laughs> get too much of the self promoter. Um, right. that that's, that's what we got to do, John. We got to get I this know. out there. So, um, thanks again for being on here. Um, again, if you want to check this album out, it's, I'm sure it's streaming on all the usual places like, uh, Spotify, mm -hmm. correct? Yep, and, Spotify, Apple, Amazon for uh, CDs. And I also have in the works coming, I'm hoping very, very soon. This week was the scheduled day it was supposed to arrive, but um, I have a small boutique run of vinyl albums made. 300, there'll be numbered copies. That's all that there's going to be. Yeah. Um, so that I'm hoping maybe we'll have in July. The goal was summer, so we'll see. Nice. So there are physical copies of this CD available via physical Amazon. CDs at Amazon. Yeah. All nice. the distribution is through nice. there and vinyl will be through there as well. I will be selling some direct, maybe signed copies. I have a couple uh, of the test pressings that I may auction off. So that's coming. Very cool, John. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show here. I wanted to get the word out about you guys. Yes. And um, we'll we couldn't do, do it without you. Here. you. We do. We'll do what we can. And who knows if this, this you could be part of the second wave of like the fleet of yachts showing up. There we go. There we uh, go. Out in the, the Detroit suburbs, not known for all their yachts, but we'll. But we do have the Great Lakes, so we've yeah, got a lot of big boats on the Great Lakes. So and, and I'm in Florida, so you know it's very natural, natural ground for all this stuff. Thank you. That's so where much. we all go in the uh, in the winter. We, have, we all go down to Florida. <laughs> Well, you'll you have to let me know when you get down here. Maybe we can go out and, and talk about uh, Yacht Rock like we planned, you know? There we go. Yes. All right, man. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you.